Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Maya Sabatello. I'm super delighted to be here today um, and have one more of our seminar speakers, um, the Disability Ethics, Intersectionality, and AI ML. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the Department of um, the Center for Precision Medicine and Genomics and the, the Department of the Division of Ethics. And this series event is co-sponsored also with the uh, Department of Biomedical Informatics. So thank you for hosting us. The seminar speakers is funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute, and it's part of a broader effort to engage in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary dialogue about how, how the, the, the disciplines of ethics, medicine, social sciences, and biomedical informatics can support more equitable outcomes for people with disabilities, both at the group level, as well as at the intersection of disability and other forms of marginalization, such as gender, race, and ethnicity. And we're doing it partially by inviting speakers uh, into our into our seminars uh, in order to have to hear about their work and have conversation about those issues that arise in the context of people with disabilities in medicine, big data, and emerging technologies. So um, today we're going to have Dr. Megan Hoffman, who has accepted our invitation to be with us today, which is really uh, a great pleasure to have you. Before we move to her presentation, I just want to have a few housekeeping notes. Um, so one is this is a hybrid event, which means uh, we are and we are recording it. Um, we have a live captioner, so if you'd like to use it, you can press it, um, the captioner uh, option on your screen at the Zoom if you're remote. Um, the structure for the seminar is that we're going to have a 45 minutes uh, presentation followed by Q&A. Um, if you're in the room and you want to raise a question, just raise your hand. If you're on Zoom, uh, I think we're, you can either uh, raise your hand in the Zoom and we'll pick up on you and you can speak up or we can, you can post your question in the, text, in the text box and we'll read it as well. Uh, at 2 p.m., we're going to have a working group with trainees and PhD students and students. So you're welcome. And that will be also here. So you're welcome to come. There's also going to be pizza for that uh, uh, event as well. Um, we're going to send around some attendance sheets here, but feel free to, to, to complete that. Uh, this is our last event for the year, so this is really an important uh, and exciting time for us as well. Um, but hopefully we're going to have some more work uh, next year as well. Now for the reason we're here. So Dr. Hoffman is an assistant professor of computer science and mechanical engineering at, at the uh, Corey College of Computer Sciences at Northwestern University. Northeastern. North Eastern, sorry, Northeastern, sorry, Northeastern University, where she directs the Accessible Creative Technologies uh, Lab. She is leading a uh, leading accessibility and fabrication researcher, and her research focuses on building technologies that enable everyone, regardless of their engineering expertise, to build safe, reliable, and customized, customizable assistive and medical devices using emerging manufacturing technologies from 3D printers to knitting um, machines. Her work on the emerging area of medical making, uh, the application of digi digital fabrication in healthcare has won multiple awards. Um, and um, obviously she is very well achieved in that area. So Dr. Hoffman will share with us some of her work with a, a talk titled, Whose Tool Is It Anyway? Um, engaging clinicians and patients as experts when creating novel healthcare technologies. Without no further ado, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you all for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to give this talk. This is the first time I've been kind of presenting outside of a computer science venue for this style of talk. Um, so it's a very kind of different interdisciplinary audience that's got me really excited to do this. Um, so like uh, Maya said, I'll be talking today about um, engaging clinicians and patients as experts in creating novel healthcare technologies. Um, and I'm going to start by giving a little bit of a background, kind of moving away from um, AI and machine learning work to my space in digital fabrication. Not because I think you guys are super excited about 3D printers necessarily, although I'm always happy to chat about those things if you are, um, but because I think we can learn a lot from the way people have approached digital fabrication in healthcare to how we should be approaching AI and machine learning as we integrate them into healthcare settings. Um, so I run the Accessible Creative Technologies Lab. Um, you can see me here working with my PhD student, Jack Hester, who's in our public health um, informatics program at Northeastern on our, working on our industrial knitting machine. So this is kind of some context of what being in a fabrication environment looks like. 
Um, I come from a variety of different disciplines, um, focusing on human computer interaction and the study of how people develop systems for human users and understanding the kind of social context of those technologies will be developed in. Critical accessibility work, looking at um, raising the perspectives of people with disabilities so that they can be kind of first order developers and users of their system of technology um, and digital fabrication, the ways that we can use uh, manufacturing commitment, uh, equipment that is controlled by a computer to serve these kind of interactive and accessibility practices. And in the ACT Lab, we focus on end user systems for access, making sure that all people um, have the ability to kind of engage in the development of assistive technologies, um, creating systems for customizing devices, making sure that people have uh, very precise technologies that are designed specifically to their needs and preferences, um, and applying a variety of technical techniques such as AI and software engineering approaches to the fabrication space. Perhaps what I am most well known for is uh, my work on medical making. Um, this is the application of digital fabrication to create medical devices and support the point of care. Um, this was a term that I developed with my uh, colleague, Yudaya Lakshmi, who's now at Microsoft Research. Um, when we were starting to think about this kind of space of fabrication intersecting with healthcare and places that are traditionally held in healthcare and clinical environments, but are now moving out into people's homes and garages. And I, when I originally started working in the medical making space, I was interested in uh, the Enable community. Has anyone ever seen any of these 3D printed prosthetic devices? Um, so these, uh, this is a community that was manufacturing in their kind of home environment, these consumer grade prosthetic like devices, um, mostly intended for children with amputations um, to use as assistive technologies when they didn't have access to a traditionally manufactured uh, prosthetic device. Um, I got really excited by this. There was a lot of news articles right when I was starting my research career about this. Um, and I was kind of brought in on the idea that I could get involved in this space without being um, a clinician myself. This led to a variety of um, research projects early on, especially looking at working in uh, multi-stakeholder settings such as special education um, schools where they would work with occupational therapists, educators, and children with fine motor impairments to create these kind of customized grips. So the example grip we see here is a red 3D printed grip that's holding a uh, spoon out. Uh, the cylindrical elements that are kind of connecting to the spoon are designed by a generative design tool, but the kind of more organic shape that the person is gripping is made out of a 3D scan of a pla uh, Play-Doh mold that the child put their hand in so that they could get the most comfortable grip. Building on this work, I moved into the prosthetic space, looking at kind of do-it-yourself end effectors for prosthetic devices, and um, particularly focusing on how the people who were using these prosthetic devices could make their own end effectors for their own tasks. Um, so for example, young Wilbur here is nine years old, and he designed his own 3D printed cello bow holder that he could use to kind of hold the bow of his cello and play in his school recital. For a period of time, I started to move away from working directly with the users of these assistive technologies to also incorporate more clinical practice and understand what clinicians were doing with fabrication at the same time. Um, so Beth Ripley here is a researcher at the Seattle uh, VHA. Uh, she now runs the Innovation Network nationally, but she started off as a radiologist who was interested in 3D printing as a way of displaying models of her patients to them without looking at these kind of complex radiological um, imaging. So she would take make 3D models of the same data that she was using and show it to patients and surgeons so they could kind of have a dialogue, a tactile dialogue about what they were going to be doing. And Beth Ripley and other folks at NIH were starting to push for this kind of change in the um, community to drive some of this work onto online spaces, including the NIH 3D Print Exchange, which is an open repository of biomedical and medical device related models. Um, so a lot of them are kind of educational models, tactile models, but they also included some enabled devices. Um, and later on, they would play a critical role in kind of supporting the community that was using 3D printing to support the PPE crisis in 2020. Now, after all of these years working with enable and other community members, I started to realize that there were kind of a few um, faulty assumptions that were being made by members of these community. Um, one was that they would say any device is better than no device. They were really thinking that, you know, instead of requiring people to go through a kind of more traditional model, work with prosthetists, if someone didn't have access to those things, a 3D printed prosthetic was better than no prosthetic at all. And in practice, this is rarely true for lots of folks. 
Um, they were also really interested in open innovation as a way of solving problems. So being able to share these devices online on places like the NIH 3D Print Exchange or uh, more freeform and general purpose repositories like the Thingiverse website um, and be able to kind of share those ideas and use this as a way of like making sure that the best prosthetics kind of rose to the top of the community. Um, and all of these kind of carry additional risks. Prosthetic devices are medical devices for a reason. There are lots of risks involved in kind of amateur made devices, um, but they assume that the users would be able to interpret these risks. Um, this is despite the fact that many of their users are very young children. Um, and so they were kind of assuming parents would take on this role, um, but also that there was like a drive from the community in these kind of open innovation spaces to engage in like making end effectors for very risky activities like riding a bike. Um, where if something goes wrong with this plastic device, you could really hurt the child who's wearing it. Now, with those kind of assumptions in mind, I started to change the communities that I was deeply engaging with, focusing more on clinician-led communities that had a different understanding of safety and risk when it came to fabrication. Um, so one group that I worked with was uh, called Project, Project Leah. They're still very active um, in the Gaza Strip. Um, and they essentially manufacture 3D printed emergency medical supplies for the hospitals there. Um, so for example, you can see Dr. Tarek Libani here with his 3D printed stethoscope. And you might think this is the same thing as Enable. They're saying like, oh, any stethoscope 3D printed or not is better than nothing. Except that Glia took a very different approach to this. They worked in a uh, very robust uh, process where they were evaluating all of these devices. In fact, this 3D printed stethoscope outperforms many of the stethoscopes sold in the United States today. Um, and they are made with consumer fabrication materials. So they were really interested in making sure that these things were safe and effective and as reliable as the traditional medical supplies they were replacing. And then 2020 came along and Project LIA became kind of the global model for medical making as we started to need PPE at a global scale and the traditional manufacturing and supply chains failed us. Um, so pictured here is a picture from ABC News. I was quarantining at my mother's house in Colorado at the time. Um, and this came up on the TV. That's actually my um, engineering high school teacher's daughter. <laughs> um, so that's my high school's uh, t-shirt. Um, and I saw that they were 3D printing face shields out of the high school after it had closed to provide to local hospitals in the area. Um, so I call him up and I said, okay, I, I've got a lot of expertise on 3D printing different kinds of medical devices at this point. I'd love to get involved. Um, and so Make for COVID brought me on as their quality control coordinator for about six months. Um, this was a really exceptional group. They ended up producing over 200,000 pieces of PPE um, before they shuttered their doors in late 2021. Um, they delivered those to hospitals in the greater Rocky Mountain region, um, as well as a variety of different reserva uh, Native American reservations in the Southwest. Um, and after we, until we stopped tracking the information, many of the PPE devices that we delivered, even in those early um, days in March of 2020, were still in use in hospitals into late 2021. Um, these were much more reliable in some way than traditional kind of disposable face shields. Um, and they also didn't focus as much on things like masks. So they were working on these kind of lower risk assisted or PPE devices. And one of the key things that Make for COVID did and kind of learned from groups like GLIA was that you needed a formal process within the community of makers to find the kind of technical mistakes and a strict review process so that you didn't send out the things that might go wrong to the actual user. So we couldn't rely on a clinician who's got a lot of stuff going on in the middle of a pandemic to be able to evaluate some 3D printed device and make sure it's not gonna break on them. So we did a variety of bend tests. This was an example of a common manufacturing error where if you bent the kind of prongs of the face shield, sometimes they would deform in this way, where if you accidentally did that while you were wearing them, it would fall off your face and you would no longer have your face shield. Um, so there was a variety of different kind of um, requirements that we had for the community. And this is why that PPE was not just produced at a very large scale for essentially a bunch of people working with uh, working out of their garage, but reliable and used in this community for an extended period of time. While I was working with Make for COVID, uh, I was also collaborating with the NIH who were trying to develop a more systematic version of what Make for COVID was doing and create a kind of FDA light review process out of um, the NIH and volunteers from the America Makes and the VHA. Um, and they were looking at all the designs that were now being posted to the 3D print exchange 
um, that were specifically PPE devices for COVID-19. And they came up with a review strategy where they deemed things as either meeting clinical review, so safe and effective in a clinical environment, similar to a traditionally manufactured device. Uh, community review standard was essentially saying like, oh, maybe don't use this in a hospital or a clinical setting, but this is very appropriate for um, you know, your local grocery store or something like that. So kind of similar to all the cloth masks um, at that time period. Um, and then they, in a few rare cases, they would mark designs as unsafe, essentially saying like, you should not use this device. It could get someone seriously hurt or killed. Um, that was mostly reserved for a few cases of and attempts at making N95 masks um, and a few like a DIY ventilators. They were very successful at labeling um, many of these things and kind of going through this thorough review process. But as you might expect, if you're receiving hundreds of samples in those early days or 3D models in those early days, and eventually over a thousand pieces of PPE were submitted to the NIH, uh, the reviewers just couldn't keep up. They were, they were busy with other tasks and they didn't have the time to do this very thorough process. We did an evaluation of those kind of reviews after the fact. Um, and one thing that really stood out from this was that the best indicator of whether or not a team was going to successfully produce a safe and clinically reviewed medical device um, was if they had a clinician on their team, if they had an expert clinician working with them in the design and verification of it. Um, and in fact, this was like a significant predictor of it. You essentially could ignore every other factor and this would predict whether or not you would produce a clinical device. Um, this included groups like the university, folks at the University of Washington, who made this N95 uh, mask. This actually does meet N95 standards. Um, there's a, essentially a replaceable cart cartridge with a filter here, and the rest of this is printed with a nylon sintering 3D printer. This is like a $20,000 industry 3D printer, not the kind of printer that you're going to have in your home. Um, and this was completely sealed off and safe and effective. But there was a little bit of a problem with what was being submitted. Uh, All right, sorry for that temporary pause, folks. The uh, uh, Wi-Fi kicked out on me on the room, but we're now on my hotspot, so we should be good to go. Uh -uh. You can let's wait for a second to see that they're responding. Yeah, yeah thank you. you. See you. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Um, so um, I will move on to the next slide. Uh, so. Um, when we looked at the work that was being made by these clinicians, what we and why they were so successful at producing these devices, we observed a few different patterns, which was essentially that clinicians had a better understanding of the context that this PPE was being used in than the engineering kind of or community makers who were trying to make these devices from prior examples. So for instance, clinicians were able to kind of recognize some of the needs that were missing from existing PPE and incorporate into their designs, including um, splatter kind of protectors above the head, um, particularly in settings where you were working with a lot of like droplets in the air, such as a surgical environment. Uh, so we've got the splatter visors there. We have durable and comfortable design. So kind of innovating on making sure that these designs could be used for an extended period of time and wear um, that they weren't traditionally designed for, um, or making sure that they could be more durable over months and months and months so that people wouldn't have to kind of swap them out every day. Um, and then uh, retargeting many communities towards these kind of quick print examples that were really reliable on uh, consumer 3D printers and making sure that they were going into more community settings where they were more safe and appropriate. What I think was the most interesting to me um, about kind of this evaluation of what people were doing during this period of time was that the designs converged really quickly. Um, we essentially saw the same three design patterns for face shields and an equivalent number for uh, masks and kind of strap designs over and ending in about May. So this was a two month period. Uh, for folks who have ever kind of looked at maker communities before, this is not, this is unheard of. They do not converge. They tend to diverge um, and be a very creative bunch, but not necessarily looking to create these same patterns. Um, and then every iteration we saw after this were really small changes to those existing designs. And this meant that we didn't necessarily have to go through a traditional review. We could just make sure that those small changes, if they were highlighted, were clinically safe. Um, so for example, people might switch out the material that goes into their 3D printer to use whatever material is available, um, which was also experiencing a, a supply chain problem at the time. They might adjust the sizes slightly so that they would fit onto different people's heads, um, or they might take a component like that, vas uh, that visor and put it onto another design so that they could incorporate those needs. 
Um, and this shows that the, the review process was feasible if we could kind of automate or detect some of these small changes. Now, one key thing I learned um, during this period of time was that even with a review process, this kind of gold star from the NIH did not mean that we could rely on these communities to still like follow the supply chain and uh, make these in a safe way. Um, and in fact, this open distribution model uh, that they were taking can lead to some misuse and misinterpretation. So for example, here's a, a photograph of a community who is 3D printing uh, with consumer 3D printers, the same mask that we manufactured at the University of Washington, um, completely kind of missing and misunderstanding that you cannot take that same 3D model and print it with these consumer printers. This is not an airtight print. And so it doesn't actually need an N95 standard. Unfortunately, they were delivering them to hospitals, telling them that these met an N95 standard because they came from the same models. And so there was this kind of game of telephone happening in the community that could result in misuse of the technology. So with that little bit of context on my prior work, I really want to talk today about how we can think about incorporating AI technologies that are emerging now into healthcare and where are the lessons we can learn from the medical maker community about making sure that that game of telephone doesn't um, kind of go the wrong way. And there's all sorts of very promising applications of AI in healthcare from medical research involving drug, drug discovery um, or kind of modeling and data science around public health trends, incorporating it into clinical practice as a diagnostic aid or a treatment guide, um, or using it in administrative settings for triage and cost reduction. But many of the people who are building the underlying technologies that will go into these innovations are making the same kind of set of assumptions that medical makers would make. Um, that any answer delivered by an AI is better than no answer at all. And so they're appropriate in settings where you might not have ready access to uh, kind of a human expert. Um, that open innovation will solve many of the challenges in the AI space. And so as long as we're getting things out the door and testing them, we will start to have this kind of innovation occur. We'll, we'll, the best AI will rise to the top. Um, and that ultimately it's clinicians or the users of these healthcare um, AI systems who will recognize and handle the risks that they can take up that responsibility while we get to those better systems. And in order for all of these kind of assumptions to actually play out as they expect, we would really need to build systems that are explainable. That is an AI system that we can immediately use as um, uh, kind of the end user of these systems and understand how they came at the results that they did and trustworthy, ones that are ultimately responsible um, for the decisions that are made by the AI or the, the pieces that go into it. And unfortunately, there isn't um, really a way to do this kind of rather ladder trustworthy. There isn't a clear answer to who is ultimately responsible for these systems. Is it the developers of the systems? Is it the people who collect the data that they're based off of? Is it the end user? Um, or is it the hospital or the clinical network that is asking their providers to use these systems? So let's talk a little bit more about how we might build or kind of approach explainable AI. Uh, kind of quick question for the audience. Does anyone, does anyone want to tell me what you think of AI as? Like, what is the mental model you have when someone says, I'm giving you an AI technology? Presentations. <laughs> right. Say that again. I said informaticians in the room. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh is big data to learn inferences and make predictions or forecasts? Statistics, but more complicated, less predictable. Yeah. All right. So that's a good, that's a good, that's a good mental model. Um, so um, when I when I ask this question to lots of different folks, you know, if they're it's a very general audience who doesn't have a lot of experience in bioinformatics, for example, you might say it's it's a computer brain. It thinks like a person or it's designed to try to approach thinking like an intelligent <laughs> user. Um, this is not actually, this is neither what these systems are. This is also not really where the community has been trying to build these systems to do for a very, very long time. Um, Another answer people give is kind of closer to um, the one you provided, which is you know, it's, it's some kind of algorithm. It's taking it's taking information in, it's doing some kind of convol convoluted process and it's processing our query and giving us an answer. Um, and this is still a very black box way of thinking about it, where we don't really expect people to understand these systems or on what goes into them in order to see how that query gets processed into an answer. 
Um, and if you talk to folks who build these systems, they might have a variety of different kind of counter terms for um, under this AI umbrella, something like machine learning, they might say it's just a classifier or a model. Um, they're essentially saying it's a more advanced statistical model that's making some inferences. And again, we still tend to frame it as this kind of linear process, but a really key uh, feature of all of this is that it's not this linear process. There is this kind of input of a data stream or some data set. And so you have two components that go into this. You have the data that's defining um, that model is built off of, and you have the algorithm itself. And this really points us to two sources of explainability in AI systems. Um, the first one is saying, well, let's make some good data. Let's do some consensus driven um, AI where we're making sure that the data is accurate. Um, it's, there's no mistakes in there that it's going to mislead the system. Um, it's fair and unbiased. So we're making sure that it's equally distributed across all the kind of necessary data points. Um, and it's comprehensive. It's not missing any important features. And doing all of this, building a data set that does all of these things, particularly in complex domains, um, is very challenging. This is also something that I don't work on. And so I'm going to talk about the other operation, which is good algorithms and particularly explainable methods um, for AI work. This means that this algorithm needs to be understandable by the user. I, I want people to leave, um, use these technologies if they have some intuition for how they work, not necessarily the deep implementation details, but you know, the same sense that you might have about an old car. You kind of know roughly how a combustion engine works. Um, and so if someone were to tell you that things were breaking down or a mechanic were able to talk to you, you might be able to have a meaningful conversation with them and not just be completely overwhelmed. Um, they need to be auditable. So we need to have a way of kind of proving that the system works the way it describes to you and that it will be uh, produce predictable answers. Uh, and it needs to be adaptable. It needs to generalize to the domains that it claims to serve. And so in order to build uh, explainable AI systems by thinking about it from this kind of algorithmic perspective, we need to take responsibility for our tools, and that means understanding how they work. And this means that the systems need to be built in this understandable way, even if it costs us that kind of broader generalization that something like deep learning is starting to promise us. So to understand this kind of understandable approach to algorithms, um, I want to go back to some very early HCI work um, by uh, McLean, who was a researcher at Xerox Park, which is a very um, kind of famous group in the 1980s into the 1990s, who were the leaders in early um, user interface design. Um, and McLean essentially proposed this idea of the tailorability mountain. He's talking about any kind of computer tool. He's really talking about like spreadsheets at this point, but I think it still works for when we talk about AI. I um, mean, he says the tailorability mountain is this a diagram where we have on one on the x-axis um, flexibility of a tool, the ability to kind of adapt a tool to a variety of different tasks and needs by the user. And then we've got complexity of the tool on the y-axis. And this is like how much work the person has to put in an understanding of the system they have to have in order to make the system do what they want it to do. And at the very top of the tailorability mountain, we will always have programmers. These are the people who have the kind of expertise in programming languages that lets them to use the, com use the computer to do whatever they want. Um, and so in this case, a programming language is a tool. But it has a variety of different other users. We've got folks at this kind of, he call it, calls it the tinkerer plateau. Um, these are folks who are maybe not using programming languages, but still have some understanding of the complexity of the tools and want to adapt them. At the very bottom of the mountain, we've got users who aren't expected to adapt the tool, they just use it as is, and therefore they don't need to understand its complexity. And again, he's talking about programming languages, and when he's talking about tinkers, he needs spreadsheets. He needs people who can kind of incorporate some computer code into a spreadsheet cell, but use the graphic user interface to do a very popular computing task. But the question for us now is, when we talk about the tailorability mountain of AI, particularly in healthcare domains, how do we help clinicians who are currently kind of framed as just end users of these tools uh, climb up to that tinkerer plateau? So for example, if we were to make a kind of generative AI tool that was helping us to adjust our 3D model, these different types of pieces of PPE, a clinician would be able to adapt and tailor the uh, gap for the airflow between the face shield and their forehead, make sure it fits their head correctly, um, and adjust the compliance of the device so that it was comfortable but still tight um, when they were wearing it for an extended period of time. So we might be able to build tools that allow us to give us this kind of flexibility without uh, requiring people to 
you know, assume some black box system that's going to do this work for them. And this is the approach I've taken to building a variety of different medical making kind of generative AI tools in the past. So for example, during those early years, um, when I was transitioning to working in clinicians, I did a, a six month ethnography in an occupational therapy clinic where we were 3D printing and creating different types of assistive technologies for the clients. Um, in particular here, these were domain experts in hand splinting. So they were making customized splints for people with mobility impairments in their hand. Um, and they were using a really established kind of standardized set of parameterized templates for these splints that they would masterfully adjust and uh, kind of tinker with until they got it tuned into the particular parameters that that person needed. So for instance, they had a variety of objectives and how they might adjust this. They cared about adjusting the thumb flexibility. So if you were trying to restrict the person's thumb, you might tighten the parts of the splint that would fit around the thumb. If you didn't care about limiting thumb motion too much, you might loosen those down. Similarly, you could adjust how tightly something was against, uh, against the wrist or allow it to be loosened so that they can use their wrist but tighten their thumb. They cared about kind of quality of life features of the design, such as breathability, making sure that there was the right amount of density of holes in different regions so that if someone were sweating while using this, it would still remain comfortable and wouldn't cause any abrasion. Um, and they generally cared about kind of fit to the user, making sure that those thumb and wrist flexibility features didn't interfere with a nice, tight, comfortable fit. And from these objectives, from them listing out these things, we were able to build a system that kind of followed a process very similar to their uh, kind of hand splinting um, craft practice. So we'd have these set of objectives and a, a couple of computer programs that could analyze these from a 3D model, as well as what we called modifiers, which just take, you know, tune some of these parameters in a way that they would do on their own by adjusting the numbers up and down. And then the clinicians were able to kind of provide a weighting between these. They would say, well, when I wanna adjust thumb flex flexibility, I increment the thumb parameters. And when I wanna adjust fit, I might also increment the thumb parameters, but I do this less often. Sometimes I increment the wrist parameters. And so you can kind of create this mapping that both the user understood and the computer system could build into an algorithm. And this allowed us to build a tool that was an understandable AI system that could take in patient data about their needs and their kind of prescription and generate a 3D printed splint. And it does this by first taking in a standard kind of splinting template. So all of those templates from their prior domain expertise, something that they would understand um, and use it on a regular basis. It would iteratively modify all of those parameters based off of the weights that they had set in the system and they could adjust for themselves. It would evaluate the splint each uh, during each iteration, making sure that it met the various requirements that they had set. And then eventually after many thousands of iterations, it would deliver the final design to the uh, clinician who could then 3D print it with us and then deliver it to their patient and uh, 3D form, uh, form these with hot water. Um, and so this was a very, this reduced the practice of creating these splints from something that might take an entire session or multiple sessions with a patient into a generative design task that takes less than a minute and then a 3D printing task um, in which time they could meet with their client and kind of talk about other aspects of their care plan. But we wanna see if this approach to kind of this explainable, very simple AI, uh, AI system would work for a variety of other domains in healthcare. So we went to look for other domain experts who didn't know anything about splints. Um, and I ended up working with a colleague who's an ophthalmologist who does a lot of cataract surgeries. And they had a very similar problem that they could structure where they said, when I go into doing a cataract surgery, I have to pick what prescription lens I'm gonna stick in someone's eye. There are a variety of different ones available in their hospital. They all have a few different parameters. Um, and usually when he's doing this, particularly because at the time he was early in his career, it wasn't, career wasn't very confident in his work. Uh, this might take a couple of hours just to make sure he was double checking all of his math and getting it just right. So we wanted a system that would solve the same problem. So again, we follow the exact same system. We input some of these kind of prescription requirements. In his case, we would kind of query the system with the measurements from his patient, uh, some of their preferences, like what glasses prescription the person wanted afterwards. Did they want to be using reading glasses or want to wear glasses when they were driving? Um, what were the brands available in the hospital at the time? And what was his tolerance for error, which might be dependent on how complex of a case he was working with? It would then modify the parameters of the lens it was choosing, kind of switching between brands or adjusting the parameters within brands to try and find one that met all of his requirements. Um, it would evaluate the lens, make sure that it would fit the patient, it would meet their predicted glasses prescription, and it would also meet other requirements such as availability and cost. 
Um, and eventually they would deliver the, the prescription to the surgeon or the patient, um, and then they could bring that into their practice. And so this was a, a very simple tool that ultimately saves him a lot of time. And he can always kind of look at the results as their process and understand why the system made the decisions that it did. A lot of my work is driven on working with communities, not just clinical communities, but making sure that people with disabilities have kind of our first order developers in the AI systems that we build. Um, so we wanna make sure that this approach would work outside of a clinical practice. And we went to a community of um, blind users who were interested in making 3D printed tactile maps. Um, so these are map graphics that you might use if you were kind of navigate a space um, for the first time. So the examples we often gave is navigating a university campus for the first time or finding all of your classes. Um, and then it would create these tactile maps that met both their kind of individual tactile literacy, these symbols that they found easy to identify, and labeled all of the key features necessary for their navigational task. And again, this iterative workflow worked very well. Um, we input some standard kind of templates from a company called Touch Mapper, which makes the kind of very standardized Google Maps style version of these tactics mm -hmm. be customized. Um, and after a while, the system would produce these more tailored tactile graphics that ultimately outperformed the original ones on navigational tasks. And so what we see from this approach is that even using what many people kind of in the more uh, development side of AI would consider to be extremely simple uh, methodologies, the stuff that's happening under the hood here is stuff we've been, algorithms we've been using since the 1960s, um, we are able to create systems that can solve really specific healthcare problems, but are still completely understandable by the end users. They understand, if not the code, the system, the reason the code is making decisions at each step along the way. Um, and this works in the generative AI space. It doesn't necessarily work in all spaces, but we can take a similar kind of approach of saying, what is the process that someone else goes through to build or make decisions currently? And how do we incorporate that into the machine? Now, I had said that um, there are two key requirements um, to building these AI systems for uh, healthcare practice. And that was, one was explainability. I think we have um, kind of an alternative to just making sure the data is good, but building um, explainable systems by making understandable algorithms. But the other piece of this is trust. Um, and I think my philosophy when it comes to trustworthy AI is best accounted for in an IBM training manual in 1979, which reads, a computer can never be held accountable, therefore a computer can never make a management decision. Um, and management here can mean all sorts of things. We're gonna say it's management of patient care, management of hospital practice, um, management of diagnostic data. Um, and this has been lost a little bit in how we present AI technologies to new users and in new applications, how we kind of sell them. So for example, when we talk about AI systems, we often use two key phrases to talk about them. We might talk about an AI agent um, or an AI tool. And while these are not really distinguishing the underlying systems that we're using, they tell users a lot about how they should expect to use the system. And I think we need to be really careful about the language that we use. So for instance, when I hear the word agent, I assume something that can make decisions um, that can take actions on its own and that has some level of autonomy. Um, and agents are a really wonderful metaphor for um, all sorts of AI applications. Um, so, you know, Siri on your phone or the equivalent on whatever um, operating system you use is an AI agent. It's one that kind of interacts with you on an almost personal level. Um, and I use many AI agents um, to build this, uh, this build this slide deck. I used image generators for some of these images. Um, I use them to generate kind of the slide designs. I am not good at graphic at graphic design, so all this nice layout stuff comes from an AI. Um, and I use it to get my Spotify recommendations so I can stay focused on listening. Um, but it's really important to know that when we use agents, we're framing people as users. If we look at the tailorability mountain, Clinicians um, who are using systems, agent-based systems, are not expected to be able to adjust or deal with the complexity of the tool in any way. And in many ways, it kind of lowers this tinkering plateau because we don't build in that kind of expectation that users are going to be the expert system, uh, experts of the systems. Alternatively, when we think, frame things as tools, we make very different assumptions about the technology. Um, Tools help us make decisions, but they do not make decisions on their own. 
tools help us take actions, but they do not take actions on their own, and tools are ultimately not autonomous. Um, and if a, a tool starts acting autonomously, you might be a little bit perturbed as a user and decide not to use the system any longer or kind of change its actions. At the end of the day, all AI are tools. There is no such thing as an AI agent, it is a metaphor, but the, there are very much tools. Um, and when we frame them in this kind of more utilitarian way, we see people having an easier time making, you know, understanding that the system might make a mistake um, and checking the work of the system. And that is really important when the decisions that are being made by these technologies are of high consequence. So I don't really mind if my Spotify recommendation algorithm gets every hundredth song wrong. I really care if it gets my prescriptions wrong or makes sure or causes me to have a conflicting prescription. Um, and this is why we can't build these systems that imply trustworthiness. So when we make the decisions about how we frame technology, when we make an agent-based system, we're asking users to abdicate responsibility. Um, while when we design them as tools, they we, many users can understand that they help us meet our responsibilities, but the responsibility and the trust is still placed on them. So rather than ask an AI for trust, we need to ask for our AIs to be understandable. And this may mean that we trade off some of the greatest innovations in the generative AI space in healthcare domains, particularly when they're making immediate decisions relevant to patient care, um, because those systems are just not, fundamentally not going to uh, build in this kind of trustworthy requirement. So if we want to build technologies that help clinicians climb this tailorability mountain, we need to build a variety of different tools that kind of build them along the way and scaffold based off of their understanding and their expertise. Um, and in practice, this means that we're going to build many individual tools that are very narrowly applied to a variety of practices rather than one generalizable AI system. And with that, I'd like to open it up to um, people for questions. I've got some um, uh, information here about the uh, many people who have funded this work, including the NSF, the Siebel Scholars, and the Pittsburgh Health Data Alliance. And if you're interested in seeing uh, any of the papers behind this work or any of the other research in our lab, you can find uh, my work at megan-hoffman.com, H-O-F-M-A-N-N, or our ACT Lab website at actlab.sites.northeastern.edu. Um, and for some giggles, here were some of the um, less creepy pasta versions of the generative AI designs that did not make it into the slide deck. That's funny. That's, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, let's open it for questions. Wait one second. Just seem to be having something. Oh, oh no, I'm just saying there's two pictures on the air that are not Yes. While we wait for questions, um, I, I, had a, I, had, I have a bunch, which we have also our session, so excited to pick your brain on some of these. Um, but I'm really, I'm really curious, especially about some of the last, I, first of all, I just love the way you connected sort of the lessons from the medical making to things we can apply even in like for many different kinds of AI algorithms. Um, and particularly this, like, I, I really loved the framing of, and I'm going to Next up, but I took many screenshots of it. Of the um, what was that? The the mountain, the tailorability mountain, the tailorability mountain. Um, and I, I really loved how you sort of framed that also as, as I was sort of thinking about this as almost like a human control agency question of where we're framing people in their ability to take agency over um, using those systems. One of the questions I had is as you were talking about this process of using um, Gen AI for sort of like tinkering with um, both the the um, the, the, I'm so sorry, I'm like blanking out all my words, but both like the, the lenses and the, the thumb braces mm -hmm. um, and things like that. I was curious, I, I, I understand it's sort of like iterative framework, but I'm curious where you see like clinicians having input or where they wanted to have input on that process. Um, because also for, for being able to sort of use AI to sort of provide, tailor those parameters of what these different things from sort of like a knowledge driven way, I can see how that kind of works. But I'm curious where clinicians wanted input or wanted to agree or disagree with the system. I think there's work in like radiology sort of showing how clinicians, when they use it as a tool, engage in sometimes a negotiation process with that. I'm curious if that came up at all in your work or even for patients. Yeah, definitely. Um, so for, for that work in particular, um, you know, the kind of published version of that system um, 
that I have I have other kind of papers that go much more into depth on on how it works. But we did a bunch of evaluations where we would pair a programmer with a clinician to build those devices, and we did it for a few devices outside of um, kind of health and accessibility domains as well. Um, and so the domain expert was the one who was kind of they had a, a form that they would fill out to kind of explain like, well, what are the things a computer should evaluate at each turn? Those are the objectives, and what are the ways that you might adjust? And they would. Uh, they were able to kind of collaboratively build the programmer, what we called the heuristic map, which is that mapping between the two of them. Um, the I actually have NSF funding right now to continue this research to build kind of graphic user interfaces and, and user programming tools that are, you know, so we can cut the programmer out of the loop in some way so that people can take an existing, in this case, like a 3D model, and they can say, well, when the 3D model has meets these requirements, I adjust it this way, and it can graphically change it um, and specify it. So that's very oriented towards kind of graph or generative um, problems. But I think we can learn a lot of the same, what we're hoping to learn along that way, along the way of that is some systems that can allow users to kind of express their understanding of data or an image or whatever they're working with in the interface that is intuitive to them instead of in a kind of data set, computer science, plug it in um, uh, to the big data pool kind of way. Um, a lot of data processing is not made accessible to the users. It doesn't look the same as the tools that users are already using to do data processing on their own. And this is a very, in some ways, a silly gap for us to have made, particularly when we're talking about data, because you know we spent so much time in the early ages of HCI thinking about like data processing as an HCI problem. That's why spreadsheets are um, an example I go back to over and over again, yet we move people away from that as soon as we start working on like bigger data sets um, for, for more deep learning kind of approaches. Um, so I think that there are, there's a lot of different experiments we're gonna have to do figuring out what is the right way to build the interface so that users have kind of can put their feedback into the system um, and understand how it's uh, making those decisions and how it, it makes sense to them. Um, but I think that there can be a lot of challenges here in terms of not overloading it with the kind of metaphors of the interface that we use in technology. I remember talking to that ophthalmologist friend at one point, he'll, he'll go to conferences and someone will be trying to sell him the latest and greatest AI tool. And he'll like text me pictures of it and be like, is this good or not? I don't, he can't evaluate it. Um, and, and he showed me one that was uh, uh, an image AI tool that would kind of help ophthalmologist looking at images of the back of the eye to recognize various different um, areas. And it, one of the things it did was it highlighted a region in green. Um, and it and the user who was trying to sell it to him, you know, the person who was selling it to him was like, oh, that green section is like important. You, like the system has decided you should really look at it. He was like, okay, but why? <laughs> why does it want me to look at this? What does this mean? I'm like, well, statistically speaking, people looked in that region on pictures like this. I can't tell you, like the system, doesn't know why it wanted to highlight this. And so um, things that might seem intuitive to the people who are building these technologies, like mapping that are not necessarily going to like convey, it conveyed to him that there was a disease process there, but it wasn't guaranteeing that, that link. Yeah. yeah. I actually have a question that's kind of related to what you just said, which is in, in kind of the world of explainable AI, I, I believe that there's some work that shows that if you show uh, clinicians an explanation that's wrong, they'll still like kind of go with whatever the recommendation was, even if there's like factual, like misinformation in the explanation. And so sort of with something like, um, like saliency mapping, which is sort of, I think what you were just alluding to, I feel like when, when developers like make their explainable salience, saliency map or whatever it may be, and then show it to clinicians, there's oftentimes this like confirmation bias almost of people start looking for explanations in the things that the model decided were important, even if the model was entirely picking up on spurious correlations or something yep. like that. So I guess, do you have any thoughts about improving that kind of pathway between like, the model explanation and the clinician explanation to make sure that it's like actually correct. Yeah, so I think kind of one of the challenges that I see happening in the explainable AI space, particularly when we we focus on data as the source of explanation, is that often the the first order approaches to explain 
the system or like your, like the saliency and um, the correlations that it's making. And it's not to explain it in the terms that like a user would who had, if you were asking a human, why did you make these decisions? Um, or why do you think that that region is important would follow? Um, and so in some ways it can be useful to kind of go back to understanding that most people who are using AI systems are, even if they're told it's just statistics and machine learning, they will still think of it as a human brain. We have, we've kind of built this into the uh, into society and that it's making intelligent decisions in that way. And so leaning into either, like if the ex only explanation you can provide is, well, oh, it's a correlation and doesn't necessarily map onto how a human would make those decisions, it may be better off just leaving the system, not using the system in that way um, than we would be, or, or coming up with some alternative system that can arrive at the same conclusion that follows a path. So maybe once you know what the system's answer is, can you derive some other explanation automatically that uses kind of a more um, standard thought process or a diagnostic process um, to kind of double check the system? I don't know how we're going to solve all these problems, but I think that leaning into like, oh, we'll just explain the correlations works really well when you're talking to people who understand, who can like build these systems or at least engage kind of as developers of them um, and doesn't work well for users. Um, it's just not gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna continue to kind of convey those biases rather than teach them um, how to use it. Or maybe people will just, it will become like AI knowledge will become general practice and incorporated into education. And so we won't have to worry about that in five, 10, 20 years, but um, I'm not sure that that's gonna be true. Thank you. We have maybe one more question. One more question. I'm kind of wondering, uh, in your project that you said about folks with mobility disability, mm -hmm. can you say a little bit more about the process and how? What were the reactions even of the community? What, what were their um, for the for the grips? Mm -hmm. um, so that one was. How did you target there exactly, and how did you reach out to them? And yeah, so those were um, that was some of the earliest work that we were doing in this space. So those are a series of case studies in a. Um, in a, a K-12 um, special education school in Maryland um, and in the Baltimore area. So this is a school for students with um, either very high kind of healthcare needs who need to be in a clinical environment during their um, school day or for students with um, severe enough special education needs that they could not um, work in the public, uh, kind of be in a general uh, general school or a mixed, mixed ability classroom. Um, and so that was uh, case studies where we were working with the occupational therapists on site who would make these kind of custom adaptations for children in a variety of different classrooms. So one thing that, that was really common um, with the, the child we were working with is that she would have customized grips um, for her grasping impairment um, made for like her art utensils and her um, fork and spoon at lunch and her pen and paper and her stylus. Um, and the clinicians would make a different Kind of have like clay model of this by hand for every single one of those tasks and they'd often break down pretty quickly and so they wanted a 3d printed version um so this was a very kind of custom process there wasn't we did end up building a, a tool that would kind of allow them to continue using the same models over an extended period of time after we left the educational environment but it wasn't um meant to be something that was like distributed to the wider community it was a one-off kind of crafting version of this um is the idea behind it that in the future teachers, for example, would be able to manage that, or is it like who, who, except for the AI and tech team, who are the ones who will be responsible to making that? Yeah, um, there's a variety of different answers to this, and I, I think it will depend a little bit on context which one um, ends up being primarily adopted. So one approach is to say that, um, and this is kind of the way folks like Enable were thinking about it, is that. Um, crafting practices using things like 3D printers, um, you didn't need clinical expertise um, to use these systems. So people might learn these that they're, you know, have access to them at their public library or a local makerspace. And so people would kind of do this on a charity model, essentially. Um, I think there are a lot of flaws in terms of that being a like expected delivery mechanism, but it, it can be nice when it is available for folks. Um, sometimes this would be like from an individual family member or, um, a lot of my work right now is focused on um, like accessible fabrication. So letting like the child do this for themselves, especially when it's a low risk mm -hmm. um, device like these grips. Um, some of the later that that work with occupational therapists really inspired the later move to working with occupational therapists in the splinting clinic as that this seemed to be the best fit in the medical system of a provider who makes these custom assistive technologies. Um, and so making that process 
faster or producing a more reliable version um, could be useful. I think that there's some, you know, I have some interest in particularly more narrow cases like the splits that this could be moved into kind of a prescriptive model so that if there was a tool that was developed, you could get this from a provider who isn't necessarily an occupational therapist, but they could kind of at least like take in the prescription from an occupational therapist and then like print them at a, like a pharmacy. Um, so 3D printing being incorporated as like medical devices made on demand. Um, but that seems like it would require a lot of change. And the closest we have to that is the innovation network in the VHA, um, where they do have some 3D printing centers nationwide that will do this kind of on-demand design and manufacturing for clients. Um, but they're doing that um, kind of very, like they're doing it in a very large scale in terms of the number of people they're working with, but it is like small compared to, you know, everyone being able to have access to this for many, many years away. Thank you very much. We're going to have to wrap up. We're just at the time. I do want to say, first of all, thank you for this wonderful presentation. We're looking forward to continuing the conversation mm -hmm. too. I also want to say thank you to um, our grad students who've been helping, Pooja, Apara, and Adrian, the Justice Informatics and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion groups, as well as the others behind the scenes, which is Anna Brero and David Lem. Um, thank you again for being here and for everyone for attending it. Thank you all so much.